everybody, how's it going? My name is Suzanne Ramsey, AKA San Francisco pianist and chanteuse, kitten on the keys. Hi, everybody. And I am, oh, there's so many of you. It's kind of bustling in here tonight. Okay. Um, the Long Nail Foundation contacted me and invited me to play some historical San Francisco songs. I'm like, that sounds like an awful lot of fun. If you know the words, you can sing along with me. Now, this first one is about the prettiest girl that the miners loved. I love a good song about spelunking. Here we go. In a cavern, in a canyon, excavating for a mine, dwelt a miner, a 49er, and his pretty daughter, Clementine. Light she was, like a fairy, and her shoes were number nine. Herring miners without topses, sandals were for Clementine. Now, if you know the words, it goes, Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, oh, my darling. Guess what else she did? Drove the ducklings to the water every morning just at nine. Hit her foot against a splinter, fell into the foamy brine. That doesn't sound too much fun, but one more time. Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling Clementine, you were lost and gone forever. Dreadful sorry, Clementine. Have lovely voices. Now, are you ready to sweat to the oldies, folks? <laughs> now, this next song, I swear, we're just gonna party like it's 1929. This is a little bit of a mixture of the Castor Street Fair, Tranny Shack, Folsom Street Fair, and the Barbary Coast. <laughs> this is a song called Masculine Women, Feminine Men from 1925. Just as bad, I'll say. Go anywhere, just stand and stare. You think they're mad when you look at the clothes that they wear. Shocking. Masculine women, feminine men. Which is the rooster? Which is the hen? It's hard to tell them apart today and say, Sister is busy learning to shave. Brother just loves his permanent wave. It's hard to tell them apart today. Hey, hey. Girls were girls and boys were boys when I was a tot. But now we don't know who was who or what's even what. Knickers and trousers, baggy and wide. Nobody knows who's walking inside. Those masculine women and feminine men. to tell them apart today. Hey, hey, you go in to give your girl a kiss in the hall, but instead you find you're kissing her brother Paul. <laughs> Ma's got a sweater up to her chin. Pa's got a girdle holding him in. Those masculine women and feminine men. Well, this is awful, awful fun. I was like, hmm, historical San Francisco songs. Do they want me to play Journey? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> so let's finish with that fabulous quintessential song, I Ain't No Jeanette McDonald, but perhaps you can be out there for me. <laughs> This 
great big world to make a place that you love. My home upon the hill, I find I love you still. I've been away, but now I'm back to tell you, San Francisco. Open your golden gate. Don't let no strangers wait outside your door. Oh, San Francisco, here is your wandering one. Say that I'll wander no more. Other places only make you love it best. Tell me you're the heart of the gold. Dan. West. Okay, everybody, you can sing with me at this last part. The words are really easy. It's San Francisco. Welcome me home again. I'll never go home. I'll go roaming. Thank you, San Francisco. for having me, and I hope you do. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Stuart Brand. Oh. Well, this is, I am Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. This is a uh, testimony to some kind of affair that people have with time. To get an audience like this to just look at old movies. Archival interest is actually interest in the future. And nobody's better at that than Rick Prelinger. So let's join him in the past and the future. Rick. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you, thank you. Your applause is totally premature, of course. You haven't seen the film yet. But um, welcome to Lost Landscapes 4. Thanks so much for coming. There's a whole lot to do tonight, so I'm going to save the big ideas for the Q&A period after the film. The film itself is going to be about 70 minutes long. And for those of you who are regulars, there's about 30 new segments. So after that, we'll have Q&A, and then we'll hang out in the lobby. So this is not your ordinary movie screening. I'm not that much of a film buff, and we're not going to be watching clips from Vertigo, Bullet, or Dark Passage. Although, sorry, but it is now clear, of course, we could make an awesome Lost Landscape show out of um, streets of San Francisco. Maybe one day we'll do that. Um, but instead, tonight's show is made out of home movies, industrial films, outtakes, pieces of newsreel, the odd bits of moving image that are just beginning to attract the attention of scholars and fans. Most of what we're going to see tonight was shot by individuals. We know who a few of them are, and we're going to talk about that, but most are anonymous. Some were shot by tourists, and a lot were shot by San Franciscans themselves. But the key thing is that they were made by amateurs. There are no committees, no focus groups behind any of this material. They show daily life, they show work, the changing look of the landscape, and quite often, uh, you know, the excitement of traveling to San Francisco. And when you begin to put together a lot of these everyday quotidian images, a different kind of history, I should actually really say histories, begins to emerge. It's a history where ordinary people and everyday life moves to the center instead of the fringes, and where the activities of celebrities, of governments, governments and corporations recede into the background. And you know, I think this is where history as a practice is actually heading in the direction of personal research and documentation. This is a very uneasy issue for scholars. I'm sorry, I don't mean to single you out. And it gets, as it gets easier for almost anyone to be their own historian, I think we're going to see all kinds of interesting and I think formative conflicts over validity and authority. And there's also going to be another problem, which is that we're going to have too much documentation in some areas and far too little of others. We see this in the world of home movies. There's too much fishing, you know, and not enough... <laughs> and not enough Mission District. Um, 
And then we're going to have to figure out how to keep digital information alive, which is actually the least of our problems, I think. So in fact, most of the film in the show tonight actually survives by accident. Industrial and sponsored films were made for specific reasons at specific times. And home movies were, of course, made to be shown within individual families, not necessarily for posterity. So while this is a feel-good show about the city we know and love, I'd also like to challenge you to think about how history is changing and how all of us can become better historians. You can ask questions about that. And I want to welcome all of you who are coming for the first time. And I apologize that it's been so hard to get into these shows. And if you have friends who couldn't get in tonight, please tell them that we'll do a repeat in 2010. And um, if they sign up in the book outside at the Long Now table, I'll send them an email. And also for the first time on December 16th, I'm going to do Lost Landscapes of the East Bay at Counterpulse. <laughs> Counterpulse the Ninth and Mission, of course, we're premiering it in San Francisco, but <laughs> what the hey. And I would also like to invite all of you to come and visit the library that Megan and I run at 8th and Folsom. You can read about it online. It's a source for mostly historical images and texts, and it's a great place to get lost. So, a few people that I'd very much like to thank. First, I'm really grateful to the G family for making their home movies available to me for this event. These are especially exciting to us because their house is across the street from ours, and we'll see our block in the 50s and 60s. Um, Kathy G. and four members of her family are here this evening, and they might have time to stay around and answer any of your questions, if you have any. And I'm also extremely grateful to our commentators, who have mics, and they're going to give us some pithy identifications and maybe some sound bikes. Each of them knows the city from a different angle. So Gray Brecken is a historical geographer and the author of the absolutely essential book, the one book you should read, no, one of two books you should read about San Francisco history, Imperial San Francisco, Urban Power and Earthly Ruin. And he founded California's Living New Deal Project, which is both an inventory of existing uh, uh, New Deal project uh, construction and residue that still survives, plus an attempt to contextualize it in the culture. Ed Holmes, who is a longtime member of San Francisco's ah, insurgent creative community, has performed with the San Francisco Mime Troupe since 1973 and has instigated and led the St. Stupid's Day Parade since the late 1970s. Thank you, Ed. And uh, Woody LeBounty founded the Western Neighborhoods Project, which uh, focuses on the history of San Francisco's outside lands, and just published Carville by the Sea, which is about an astonishing episode that happened in the 1890s when San Francisco transit operators sold surplus cable cars and horse cars to the public, who repurposed them as bars, restaurants, studios, houseboats, and a bohemian settlement on the beach. It's an amazing book, and you can see him afterwards and find out how to get a copy. Now, we have expert commentators, but you are the soundtrack. This, by the way, is you. If, uh, if you know what you're seeing, shout it out. If you want to know, shout out a question. If, and feel free to comment. Remember, there's a little bit of sound in the show, but a lot of the show is silent, and you have to fill the gap. There's not going to be any waves of music to wash over you and put you to sleep. And I end with my pitch. This is it. We need film. If you have any historical footage of the Bay Area, did your family shoot home movies? Did your friends? If so, I'd really like to hear from you. I spend um, far too much time each year looking for film for this show. And I know there's a great deal more out there, so I would love your help. And that's what I've got. And, <laughs> and on with the show. Thank you. Gate City figures out an up-to-date way to send its greetings to the world by way of the sky, in letters 10 feet high. A new idea that's just as bright and cheerful as San Francisco itself. The autogyro is piloted by Captain Claude Owen, and the captain's taking an awful chance in that crowd of buildings. One little slip, and the greetings will turn into something not quite so cheerful. He's aiming for the beautiful Civic Center, and he's only got a space to land in 125 feet by 300 with a trolley line at the upper end. 
but the captain knows his stuff. And for the first time in history, a plane lands on San Francisco's front porch. Well, it's a nice thought, San Francisco. And the same to you and many of them. That was the library building back there, the old library. Anybody know where this is? It's the old ocean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So this is uh, shot in 1941 by John Summers. Um, we've used a little bit of his film before. He shot a comprehensive and somewhat jittery view of most of San Francisco. <laughs> Treasure Island. He's tall. <laughs> <laughs> He's operating an electronic device under 10,000 feet. Obviously a C-47, maybe a DC-3. Uh, type A, I think. That's a really quite beautiful way to shoot a plane. It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Is he flying that plane right there? <laughs> well, he is seem to be in the left seat. Oh, no, he's in the back seat. He's in the back seat. Yeah. I think my mic is on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want my wife to see this. <laughs> TSA. <laughs> That's SFO. It's a WPA oh, project. Is that a DC-3? There's so. Yeah, I really want one. Yeah, I want one. <laughs> <laughs> it's still too That's 19. LA, that's it? from 1938. If you include security, it's still that long. Yeah. <laughs> this is about 62 or 63. Uh -huh. Is this before Candlestick got enclosed? <laughs> Go left, go left. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Both no. ways in the top there. Way lower high rise. This is just before the, the high rise boom. This is about 64, 65, I believe. Interesting. Yeah, it's got to be late 50s, right? I stand corrected. Transportation to San Francisco was by ferry a convivial mode of travel that, particularly in the evening, had elements of fantasy and generated a sense of adventure that even the meek could enjoy. Many a commuter dreamed secret dreams when the blown spray wet his cheeks and his soul soared to the undulation of these crime to the Bay Area. I know. That's interesting. Whoa. That was last week. <laughs> <laughs> it's that S curve. <laughs> this is a two short excerpt from a long film. The huge steel towers rose like magic. After years of planning, the visions and blueprints of the engineers took physical shape under the skilled hands of the men of action. The bridge men, long experienced in this hazardous business, went about their work, sometimes in precarious positions, expertly guiding the steel into place. Some sections weighed as much as 79 tons. <laughs> All the steel sections were fabricated at American Bridge Company's plants at Gary, Indiana, and Ambridge, Pennsylvania. Whoops, he's stuck.
On the tower, 500 feet above the water, bridgemen adjust and secure the wire rope. To provide a firm, safe footing for the bridgemen, a special type of catwalk was designed. USS Cyclone chain link fence was chosen for its light weight, low wind resistance, and great strength. This bundle of cyclone fence will cover a distance of 100 feet. When sufficient flooring had been placed to reach the next tower, it was stretched into position. This job calls for iron nerves for the bridgemen ride the catwalk during the stretching operation. <laughs> but after the precarious footing during tower erection, this 10-foot catwalk was the same. Hello, OSHA? Oh, leave that one. Fun, but with a serious purpose. To keep the wire mesh sliding freely as it is stretched over the steel rope. <laughs> San Francisco Bay looked like this from the catwalk. Far below, the old ferry boats plow stolidly along, soon to be replaced by trains of electric cars, automobiles and trucks, rolling in an endless stream across the bridge that soars above. At dinner time, the bridgemen lose no time heading for home. A run along the catwalk to whet the appetite, then the sky ride, and down the escalator, helter-skelter. Remember that Unical Tower? I am. Bring it back. <laughs> I don't know if any of you saw the Nixon campaign ad on the side of the building a minute ago. <laughs> Eastbound tolls. <laughs> I guess I'm, am I still in? This is about 1937, 38. We want to go in the carpool lane. <laughs> Rumble seat. Don't do it. the dog perspective. There you go. <laughs> Talking dog, go ahead. There are quite a number of these sort of triumphal movies after the bridge is open. They, they, uh, everybody shot their trip across the bridge. Not many cars, it was expensive. The bridge was built with a second level to accommodate the most modern interurban trains in operation anywhere, controlled at each end of the bridge by a tower that houses the switches, relays, and circuits that make up the nerve centers of one of the most efficient train control systems in existence, with safety devices that are the product of the most modern engineering genius. Inside the cab, the motorman controls the speed of his train in response to the panel, <laughs> which indicates 35 miles an hour at this point. This indicator is part of an elaborate safety system worked by means of electrical impulses carried through the rail. If the motorman were to disregard the speed indicated on the panel, control of the train would be automatically taken away from him. There has never been a train collision on the bridge since they began to use it in 1939. This film was made in 1945. The bell indicates a change of speed. Watch closely and you'll see the indicator drop to 25 miles an hour. If he gets too close to the preceding train, he is automatically stopped. And that's nice to know in a fog, uh, which sometimes creeps in on the San Francisco side. Approaching the terminal, where the air is fragrant with a smell of spice and roasting coffee, 
the speed drops from 17 to 11 miles an hour. Transbay Terminal, interior, naturally. Love it while it's there. This is the 41, and this is 50s. We used to have a freeway in front of our ferry building. <laughs> and I don't know why this footage was shot, but it's really interesting. It's um, early south of market, focusing on transportation. This is the uh, State Beltline, Harbor Beltline Railroad. Where are we? Second? Second Street. Maybe Folsom? When steampunk was real. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's even realer now. So this is, um, I believe, the United Railroads strike of 1917. Um, this is a, a piece of news footage. I know nothing about who shot it or about its origin. Is this the iron workers? It's maybe the iron workers. Yeah, I think that's the Union Iron Works down on Petrero. Got it. And then they're, but they're going to um, have something to do with the streetcar. Same year, I believe. This is an early version of Critical Mass. <laughs> it's before they invented bicycles. Do we know where we are, the assembly hall? What number is that car? What number is that car, Rick? Can you tell? Not from here. Yes. So I wonder, and maybe when I see it on the big screen, I wonder if the iron workers and the railroad strike have been mixed, cut together. Oh, it's a sick... <laughs> Here are the first pictures of strike-paralyzed San Francisco in the grip of a general labor tie-up. Streets are deserted as surface cars cease running and citizens unable to travel remain indoors. Only a few automobiles can operate because most filling stations have exhausted their supplies and can obtain no more gasoline. Motor trucks stand idle where their drivers left them. Very little food is being moved into the city and with a threat of famine before them, crowds jam the market. But supplies dwindle rapidly, and there is no meat to be had. To the possibility of mob violence is added fear of pestilence, while on every hand, closed shops give mute testimony to the disastrous economic consequence of the strike. Mayor Rossi states the position of his administration. I must insist, first, that law and order shall prevail. Second, that those desiring to furnish the people of San Francisco with the necessities of life, must be permitted to do so without hindrance. Efforts of business interest to forcibly open the strike-paralyzed port of San Francisco fail. Open warfare rages through the streets of the city as 3,000 Union pickets battle 700 police. 
Guns, tear gas, clubs, and fists bring That's injuries good. to more than 80 persons and cause the death of two. Listen to the striker's side of the story. We are asking for a general strike to keep organized labor on the Pacific Coast. We are not only asking for it, but we're going to get it. Then with a general strike and additional violence threatened, 2,500 guardsmen move in, commanded by Colonel Mittel's state. The California National Guard has been ordered into active service by our governor for the purpose of maintaining law and order in San Francisco and protecting life and property. This we propose to do at any cost. These idle ships and piers have more than local significance. They are symbols of wasted millions and represent a backward step in our recovery program. So that was, uh, that was hysterical national newsreel footage from the 1934 uh, longshore strike, which became a general strike. And this is uh, a parade probably mostly of uh, members of the ILA under uh, left-wing rank-and-file leadership along the Embarcadero. It's uh, unusual footage. We don't know uh, exactly who shot it, whether it was uh, the union, whether it was police, whether it was newsreel, whether it was freelance. It kind of gets close in. Yeah, some of those battles were happening right where uh, the ballpark is today. The Giants and, ballpark. And on Rincon Hill, big, the Battle of Rincon Hill, as they called it, July uh, 5, Quiet day on the... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and um, this is footage of the Barbary Coast, yeah. about Pacific. 1914. It, it's a fragment, that's right. It's like Pacific Street or Jackson or something? I believe it's Jackson. Pacific. You're always wrong, Rick. <laughs> hey, I just show the films. You will see more women. It has as much to do with... Uh, Follow the sailors. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> no women in there. But you know, I've heard that before at other screenings, and in the public sphere, at a certain point, you see there there are many fewer images of women navigating the streets in the film that I've been able to find. But I think we've made up for it in other ways. Wait and see. Uh, that was 1914, 1915. This is the same neighborhood in 1931. These are amateur films. <laughs> Bingo. All right, all right. And this is the same neighborhood in, in decline, as you can obviously see. Journey in Pacific. And this is the Shrine Parade from, I believe, 31 or 32. And this is the native sons and daughters of the Golden West proposal for the, the what became Coit Tower. And here we begin the G Family's movies on a roof in Chinatown around 1945. Mm. Auburn Alley. This is a standard eight millimeter film transferred. <laughs> Hell 
all fresco down. Yeah. Yeah. In a minute, you'll see children that are in the audience. This is probably right after the war, isn't it, Kathy? I think 46, 47 ish. I think that's Powell. Yay! Playland. The Goofy Village, they said, put screams in your dreams. <laughs> and the roller coaster went down in 55, I think, so it's before that. The chutes was like a water slide ride with no seat belts. <laughs> I believe this uh, baby's in the audience tonight. And this is now on Union Street, isn't it? Are you sure the baby survived? <laughs> and it's a goodbye to Union Street and hello to the Richmond District in 1954. <laughs> it's the go-go 50s. Into the fog. <laughs> this is Kathy G in front, who's here tonight. What high school? Washington. Washington. Go Eagles. <laughs> it's the, the call bulletin paper route. It's not the shopping news. <laughs> Safety patrol. And then this is the year it snowed. Fifty-two? Sixty-two, thank you. And this is up on Miraloma, you know, by Portola. Yeah. The Miraloma Lodge is still there. You can get a drink. And then this is when our neighborhood was exciting. <laughs> Still is. This is 15th in Balboa. I know. <laughs> 
Watch for the very last shot in this sequence. It's kind of funny. <laughs> and we're looking down, what is that, Jones, maybe? Taylor. I think I'm zero for three. This is 1941. Hats and gloves. And this is earlier. Uh, color film starts to look reliably good in 37, 38, although it goes back much further. That's the Humboldt Bank building. This is 1941 again, in the summertime. They had four tracks on Market Street, so it was kind of uh, dangerous to board the streetcars in the inner side. If you mean the Covarrubias mural, I think it went back to Mexico. It was from the Treasure Island Fair. This is the, uh, during the uh, transit strike. When is that, 1949, 47, 49? When people uh, actually drove in and parked on market. Looks like, right, they're all at church. <laughs> that's the Weinstein department store. See, that mid-market, that needs a lot of work. Maybe some billboards. <laughs> you can see the de Young building there on the left before they put the... Uh, uh, the steel on it has just been restored. Is that the Gary streetcar coming in? And this is uh, Charles Lindbergh. I don't do this as a tribute to Charles Lindbergh, but because it shows Market Street in 1927 during his ticker tape parade. And again, it's this whole idea that the periphery of the image is often more interesting than what you see in the, in the foreground. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> He's got a great driver. And his reception at Civic Center Plaza. So this is, I showed you a little bit of it last year. This is the part I didn't show you. And we've just done a new print and a new transfer. And it looks quite nice. So this is the one where the same cars and wagons keep coming in front of the camera, right? Yes. And for a long time, it was thought that this film was produced in 1905. And then the license plate collectors were mobilized. And they... <laughs> As usual. <laughs> and they rose to the occasion, and they happened to know that I think that one that just went by, 4867, wasn't issued until early 1906. And so they've been able to date this as, as early 1906, 
So this is uh, uh, potentially even a few weeks before the quake. The total film is um, it's about 11 and a half minutes. I think we're looking at three minutes of it here. And one day, one day, some way, somehow, we'll do a beautiful HD screening somewhere, and I'll let you guys know. There we go again. <clears throat> so this is really an argument, you know, for that idea that's been gaining uh, belief, gaining credence in, in Holland and in Europe that minimal traffic control causes people to behave sort of survivably. <laughs> what are these guys in the right smuggling? This is where he gets run down. <laughs> I mean, if you think that the uh, if you think that the uh, there's a lack of civility now between cyclists and pedestrians, the the issue between horses and horseless carriages was, you know, contested extremely intensely and often violently in those days too. Each horse could drop 10 pounds of fecal matter on the street every day. Just a little side note. Just like our governor. But well, they made Golden Gate Park. Move it along, move it along. Yeah, one thing that's interesting is this cable car really doesn't seem to stop. <laughs> there's, there's 4867 again. Stop! Stop! <laughs> I hit you over the head last year with about eight minutes of post-quake apocalyptic damage. So this year we just have a few shots, um, which we uh, hadn't seen before. We saw a, a, a poorer version of one of them in previous years. So this is just a little bit. This is at the, obviously, the periphery of the burn zone, somewhere around Van Ness. And then this is along Fillmore, you know, the new business district that emerged almost immediately after the quake. What I just love about this is the, you know, it's the, the intimacy of it. It's a great piece of actuality footage. It doesn't have a narrative. It doesn't have a story, which is why I like it. I think that's Eddie and Fillmore. We looked up the storage company in the phone book from that period. And this is the now gone uh, Fillmore Street, help me, it's the counterweighted cable car line where uh, the weight of one car helped pull the other up. As w Gravity, thank you. This is shot around 38, 39 by a visitor. 
Fillmore Street. Where's the line of tourists? <laughs> I think tourism was down a little bit and, you know, before the World's Fair. It was a depression. It is quite empty. And this is this, um, this was, uh, these are outtakes for a film shot for the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, and I just like it because it's like vertigo on cable cars. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot of this. I purposely cut it so that there's no geographic continuity at all. <laughs> it's, um, I said 63 and then a member of the audience last year emailed me, I think, to say it was 64. So I thank you for that. What about the license plate guys? <laughs> yeah, license plate society. Right, we're the license plate collectors when we need them. <laughs> All these cars have retired and live in Havana now. <laughs> Aren't you going there next, Ed? Yeah. Turn it up a little bit. Hills and land go through the town by night and day, and sunshine touches every hand in parks. Sixty-nine, where I think. Play. Over the hills and all along the way, we're building a dream for tomorrow. We're building a dream for tomorrow. 
We're building a dream for tomorrow. That's Bechtel's theme song. We're building a dream for It's an tomorrow. earworm, I warn you. Along the way, in three counties, BART is building a high-speed rail rapid transit system planned for your convenience, designed for your comfort, and deliberately aimed at giving you a safer, faster, more economical ride than your automobile. Fully aware, as Lewis Mumford says, that a city exists not for the constant passage of motor cars, but for the care and culture of men. Cities will maintain their character, too, unscarred by heavy concrete swaths of freeway, freeways that carry the extravagance of one car, one passenger, mostly at a standstill. Instead, BART trains carrying thousands of comfortably seated passengers will glide quietly through the bay tube, under the ferry building, and into the Market Street subway. So when you climb across Market Street or ride a bus that's been detoured, remember that your surface difficulties are temporary, <laughs> while below ground here, and in the other two urban core cities, Oakland and Berkeley, 975 sandhogs are tunneling 21 miles of subway. And when it's completed, you and the Bay Area will not only feel better, you'll both look better. In the Powell Street station, you'll look something like this. Along the way, you may stop at a magazine stand, buy commute tickets from the automatic vending machine, Enjoy the clean, spacious, architect-designed station. Chrissy Field. Uh, 50s, not clear. This is the Ransohoff family home movies, and they took their employees to the uh, Golden Gate International Exposition early one morning. And we'll visit with them for a few minutes. Uh, so the Ransohoffs was a, a women's clothing store. If you remember in Vertigo, he dresses, Jimmy Stewart dresses Kim Novak at Ransohoffs. They had stores in San Francisco and in Los Angeles as well. National Cash Register Pavilion. Do they go to Sally Rand's? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, they do. <laughs> this is still a family-friendly show, however. This is Treasure Island and the Golden Gate International Exposition, 1939-1940. It's the Tower of the Sun. The cash register, didn't it count how many people came to the fair? I believe it showed had the a, attendance figures, yeah. Yeah, had a running total. That's the gay way. <laughs> Step right there up. There was a the scientific door. presence there.
They misspelled nude. The, the cow girls in Sally Rands wore these sort of body stockings that made them appear naked. This is amateur footage of the opening of the bridge. Golden Gate, 37. Uh, any people in here in 87 when they closed the bridge? Well, you almost broke it, you remember. Uh, this is in Lakeshore, which is a neighborhood between Ocean Avenue and uh, Sloat Boulevard, out in the west side of town near Lake Merced. I think this is 1946. Everybody has a green strip of lawn. That was and, before they started painting the sidewalk green. And that's like Stern Grove in the background there, the trees. And this is uh, uh, Golden Gate Heights. This is Elderly tomatoes and other ancient fruit, grandfather eggs and such. The ammunition for the annual brawl between the frosh and sophomores at University of San Francisco. It's a scene of bloodshed and slaughter, a frightful toll of carnage and destruction. So I Brave young this man is advancing to an unknown land, fate that might be worse than death itself. It finally finishes in a draw, but it'll never be forgotten, the Battle of Garbage Hill. I think that was like the Masonic Cemetery. Or... Yeah. This is about 1924, and we actually recently found in our library the popular science magazine with a cover story on filming this newsreel. Oh, this is nuts. I've seen this. Now, which windmill is this? Can anybody tell? There's two windmills in Golden Gate Park? Well, there will be. I think this is the northern one because of what you'll see in the background. The northern one, or the Dutch windmill, has uh, round sides, and the uh, Murphy windmill has uh, an angled edge. Suicide club. Puke. <laughs> so we're in the park now in 1938-39. The old D. Young. Yeah. Actually, two D. Youngs back. And this kind of speaks for itself. It's about youth in San Francisco. The golden San Francisco. I know, I live there, on the tower. Seagulls, pigeons, but I like it. Yeah, 
We dig it the most. On a towel, I can see everything. Once in a while, I spy. I see the shoes. They think they're the toughest, but not the bosses. But I don't blame them. Nothing to do. If I had something like that on my corner, I'd shimmy, shimmy, co, 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 too. The mole. You can always tell, flat feet. Ace on every corner. Don't look too hard, fellas. They got guns. You got a thousand fellas. The king. Pin this tough sheen. It's the bosses. Because it's barred. From some honor. At night. You can always tell that's the lonely ones. Bet you. Some parts of mission. You can always tell. A thousand on every corner. If hair was a crane, they'd be right on deck for with chestnut. Look out, old man. Look out, old man. Mike is on the scene. Head first. Light up, fellas. Didn't cost me anything. Five fingers and a quick getaway. Some store suffers. So remember this, the Petrero Center? Yeah, it was Seal Stadium before that. Seal Stadium before that. Okay, where are we? This is 1939, and it's... Visitation Valley. Visitation Valley? That's my guess. <laughs> I think this is quite a sweet little movie, and it looks awesome. That's when service stations deserve their names. Yeah, I'm guessing Viz Valley, and I'm thinking maybe somewhere over there in the southeast, it looks like. Yeah, I'm thinking near Bayshore or something like that. I was like thinking that. it might be Bayshore. Good call. When you shoot home video, shoot the gas stations and the bars, you know, don't do the, don't do the flowers. This is a bit uh, loaned by Scott Stark. Batter, and so is this. Two balls and three balls and one strike. Foul ball. Mari <clears throat> again hitting bad luck and hit a fly. Anything to back it at. Hurry, hurry, Monroe gets the walk. Is that Jackson playground? Here we have the players all lined up after the game. They sure did a swell job. But they didn't quite make it. Nevertheless, in the background, you will see the members and their wives and friends uh, that were here today uh, to encourage them in a victory. We this didn't quite make it. But better luck Carole next time, Army. boys. They're all excited. They're having their pictures taken. But uh, in a short time, we'll all be together again. And OK, boys, I think uh, this is it. We're just about ready to say goodbye for the day. So signing off for Argonaut Lodge. Boys, next time you have to get out and win again. These are loaned by Scott Stark, and these are movies he found in his house. The previous owner had a small film company. This may be a wartime victory garden, or it may be immediately post-war.
It's a little hard to tell from the uh, codes on the film. <laughs> Time to go to Wildside West for a beer. And they built their um, addition onto their house and refronted their house in 1947. Uh, and so that's when this footage comes from. Nice ad in the middle of a residential neighborhood. There was actually a film lab in that house as well. And this was the view. No diamond heights, residential. No Sutro Tower. Sears. Do we know where we are? Deep trouble. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be going to one of the coastal defense batteries, presumably. 
And this we just found. This, by the way, is before Kodachrome had stable dyes. <clears throat> so, it's about 1959, and I want you to watch closely when we see uh, the exercise yard. So you can actually see inmates. This is uh, just below the Cliff House in Sutro Heights. It's the edge of Playland. I'm still looking for more Sutro Baths material. You're going to see every frame that I have. And your job this year is to find me more Sutro Baths material. This is 1939. That pier used to have a pipe, and they would pump the seawater all the way down to, like, Larkin Street for a bath down there, the Olympic Saltwater Pumping Company. They're mavericks. <laughs> Tourism footage. The pier lasted until like the early 70s, I think. Part of it started breaking down, and the little pumping station was in Playland, and it was there until they tore Playland down in 72. There's the surf club. That's where the surfers are. <laughs> These are all covered up now, for the most part. That carousel is at uh, Yerba Buena Gardens now. Uh, that's a matter of controversy. So Playland is being demolished. I didn't do this. <laughs> you take what you can get. There, that's the pumping station. See, it says Bush and Larkin. Yes, that's right. What, real estate development mostly, wasn't it? Yeah. I think it was Jeremy Etz Hokins. It was. Diamond Heights, too.
That's the friends and relations. You know, that building, that was the surf club before. It was a place called Topsy's Roost, which was sort of a racist Sambo chicken restaurant in the 20s. And here's our four-second shot slowed to eight of the front of the Sutra Baths. I want more. And that's the Sutra Baths as well, before they burn down. Shot from a blimp. Sixty-six burned down. They had a fire of the little buildings between the Cliff House and Sutro Baths in like 63, but the main baths burned in 66. <laughs> it might have been arson. It was a money loser for the uh, owners at the time, and it had already been closed. There were plans to build a big um, high-rise apartment building there. And before that, they were going to have a men's club, the Pacific Edgewater Club. We're going to see what we got here. Yeah, they're here. Hey, come on in and sit down for a while. And they're moment yeah. mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like it. Right. Look at the carpet. The seat is really comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> here, sit down and relax. Very fine. Big window. Very nice. Testing one, Lovely two, color. three. This is the public address system, which the attendant will use to call out the station. Like our sofa. Did you see this adjustable reading light? Sort of like a jet, only it seems more roomy in here. No straps, huh? No, no. No, no. In the rear half of the car. From our, uh, from our panel up here. Okay. So, how, how come film is so much more powerful than stills? I mean, something happens here when you see this stuff moving. You know, for me, it's the unexpectedness. It's that you don't know what's... <clears throat> as, as still, you, you see it one moment, and it's a self-contained moment in film, you never quite know what's going to happen, what the twist will be. And then another thing I noticed, the editing is pretty interesting because you're all over the place. Now, is that going to scramble our minds? This isn't sequential in time. It isn't sequential in region exactly. It's a little loose, but I never claimed to be an editor. <laughs> <laughs> but also, you know, it, it, it wouldn't profit by being completely rigidly tied to the map. So I, there's a vague, you know, neighborhood focus, but I did lose it a little bit this year. Should we, oh, we have our stools. Yeah, I've, I'm noticing myself walking because of this damn movie. You know, you see Hollywood film, there's nothing about walking, but people are walking in this, you know, really idiosyncratic way all through the year. Yeah. <laughs> Your, uh, your sea legs, you have to get your sea legs back. Something like. You've been at this how long? Um, I started collecting film about 25 years ago. I was in New York and I was a, a typesetter working nights and then my roommates got money to make a movie and so I got hired as research director. And the movie went into limbo but I started to collect material. And uh, this went through a number of incarnations. And then about 10 years ago, I moved out here, and many of you know, our collection went to Library of Congress, but we have continued to collect, and the big focus now is amateur film, local history, a few other things, but not trying to collect the world anymore. So what happens, I mean, you've been looking at this kind of stuff, the stills and the footage and the ephemera and so on over a period of time, and you develop your collector skills and your creator skills. What happens to your sense of, t of history and time, and in this case, San Francisco? 
when you watch this stuff that much over that long a period of time. Right. You know, it's this issue that um, I wouldn't make it as a scholar conventionally because because I'm interested in history as it's represented in history as it's experienced and then put back out again through the minds and the, the eyes and the hands of these makers. So there's a certain looseness, but on the other hand, it's loosey-goosey, but it's also tremendously vivid. And it's a great, I mean... Um, what do you I, see I, now that you didn't see the first year or two? What kind of things you're spotting? Right. I mean, the detail is very, very interesting. I try mm -hmm. to look at the detail very closely. But I'm also interested in what the detail reveals, mm -hmm. uh, what the traces reveal. Um, who's hanging out in the periphery? What's on that sign? What is that little kid in the corner actually doing? You know, it's, it, it's, it's an eye for um, that kind of telling detail. Yep. And also, may I say something else? It's yeah. also, it's, um, when you look at most conventional historical documentaries, typically somebody writes a story and then they try to find pictures and sound to fill it. You know, sometimes they even call it eye candy. Uh, they're, they're trying to cover a pre-existing script. And I'm really interested in what arises out of the material. I don't like this conventional storytelling thing. It's tyrannical. It's setting, you know, documentary back to insist that you have to have a conventional narrative arc and force all the material. The material is its own story. So people, how many people here shoot video one way or another with iPhones and flips and whatnot? A lot of people. Uh, they're going to be shooting anyway. Some of that stuff's going to come to you or your successor. Uh, what would you prefer they shoot and not shoot? Okay, no more fishing. <laughs> but, you know, you want the, bat, the, you want the, the gas station the restroom in the gas station? I mean, you, yeah, yeah, I'd like, I mean, you know, um, no flowers, <laughs> <laughs> no uh, gardens, no, unless, you know, it's, unless it's <laughs> there's action food the made, yeah, unless there's action, uh, no pans over buildings where you follow the building line like this, but focus on, um, one of the things that's great about the, the G family films is that they were just so systematic and completist about shooting life, you know, mm -hmm. their own lives in a background against the city as the places, you know, they went to Golden Gate Park, there's wonderful footage of Golden Gate Park, so it's a sense of people within the landscape and people in a social environment, and that just makes it so special to look at now. Um, what's that? Well, if the G's would like oh, to yeah, raise their the hands, I don't want to force them there they are. But yeah, it's everyday life. It's that stuff that, you know, you want to think what was somebody's everyday experience. They went to the gas station, they went to the bar, they went shopping. That's what really kind do of, you, been, you know. Do you collect stuff in the moment? Do you collect stuff from this year, from last year at all? Only stuff I shoot. Yeah, I, I don't collect video very much. It's so Okay, hard. so you shoot. I just, with my still camera, yeah, I shoot video. And as an archivist, do you find yourself shooting differently than you would if you were... Oh, totally. Say more. Totally. What do you mean? I, I go to the airport and I turn my camera on and I put something kind of next to it so it doesn't look like I'm shooting and I shoot 18 minutes of people walking by. I don't know why. <laughs> you know, everything looks beautiful when you see it on a little glowing rectangle and it just... And it, it uh, I shoot a lot of sort of record of, of things hmm. like that. I shoot, I love, uh, uh, I think most of us love footage that's driving POV, shot out of the front of a car or a train or a cable car, um, and I shoot a lot of that. Yeah, that trip down Market Street is... It's amazing. Astonishing. Yeah. And it, it, what is, it's interesting is it builds up stuff and you're sort of learning how to see what's there. Mm -hmm. And, you know... And, oh, my gosh, there's a guy on a bicycle. There's a horse. That, and, the, and your point about the, the, the free-flowing, everybody-goes-anywhere traffic pattern, that's... We should have a day. <laughs> everybody will stay home. In San Francisco. You see, you know, we just turned off the traffic lights. Work it out, people. <laughs> Be a test. 
You could have done that in the 60s. Everybody would remember it. It's like the day when the various countries, when they switched from driving on one side to switching on the other, and yeah. the whole country came to a stop and crept intrepidly across the street. Well, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? Music on the sidewalk. That was amazing. And, and the walking on the bridge, that also could be you know, much more regular than every 50 years mm -hmm. or whatever it is. That's right. <laughs> really? <laughs> that, right. And what happened? <laughs> Nobody died from the traffic, probably. Well, this is this point, you know. <laughs> You're right, you're right. This is this thing we were talking about before. And it will happen again, um, so we'll know. Okay. It's, it's, it's nice, you know, not necessarily to think of this material as coming out of antiquity, uh, yeah. just representing the past. When I look at historical material, I always kind of think of it in, as possibly predictive as well. Maybe this represents something that we're going to come back to, or it represents a state or, a, you know, a, 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 some kind of quality of living which... which may happen again in the future. So I don't just buy this rigid boundary between past, present, and future at all. Well, it's certainly true. I've seen buildings that you know, change over time. We saw some in the Market Street there that put steel and metal yes. in the front. And then somebody looks at the old photograph and, you know, that was better. And then they, they recreate the building the way it used to be. And then that mm -hmm. beats back and forth a couple mm -hmm. times. Does film make people do the same thing? I don't know, does film... Hats, I mean, hats look like a lot of fun, yeah. you know? <laughs> right. We know film influences fashion. You know, we know that uh, the China syndrome uh, caused, put nuclear power in the, in the trash for a number of years. Films sometimes have effects like that. In this case, I don't know, this is, you know, what are we going to make of San Francisco? Are we going to look back and be nostalgic and try to keep it from changing, or are we going to try to guide its change in an intelligent way. I mean, that's the spirit that I'd, I'd love this material to be taken in. Well, that's an interesting issue. Do you have any tips on how to find archival footage? I mean, clearly you've learned a lot. Yeah, so it's everywhere, it turns out. You know, um, mm. Probably in uh, talking about original film, you know, rather than copies of material, uh, probably you know, do you light up when you see a garage sale and, or things like that? Is there things you've learned in the years doing this? Uh, there's like a few know? things I've learned. Sometimes I get lucky. The, the USF Vegetable War and the auto gyro landing on City oh, Hall that was amazing. Plaza, that came out of a basement in the Richmond district that I just happened to ask, and there were a bunch of cans of nitrate film. Um, there's film everywhere. You know, probably 20 million families shot 8 and 16 millimeter. And um, it's all over the place. After a while, it just kind of comes to you. <laughs> Flypaper effect. <laughs> so um, when somebody brings you something, do you copy it or do you want the original and they don't have it anymore? Or how does that work? Ideally, we would, we would collect the original. Um, in many cases, we'll pay to transfer people's films. And right. uh, we'll have a copy to work with and they'll get a video copy as well as getting their films back. A lot of ways. It's like the Library of Alexandria. They, you know, they went out and they emptied yeah. all the ships of all the... Except they had no choice. And they choice. copied them and gave right. the copies back. That was right? compulsory. And you can now sail on with the copies of the books we just stole. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think uh, this... I'm serious about that we should all be better historians. This is something... The barrier to entry is very low. Any of us can do this on a neighborhood level or on a regional level. Well, Collect and redistribute. So is everybody shooting video now? Is, is, you know, is the whole world of archiving going grassroots, or, or what happens now? Um, so good point. Uh, there's a big shift in the archival world away from the good ideas are not coming from the big centralized institutions in D.C. and New York and L.A. The interesting ideas are coming from the periphery, regional, and local archives. Home Movie Day. Many of you may know about that, something that happens every year in about 70 cities now where people bring home movies and they get shown and some of them make it into archives and they learn about what the, the issues are. Um, and people are starting to think a lot about how to collect their um, and preserve their personal digital materials. So and I think that's the next big thing. 
is, is the net and YouTube and all that kind of making all of this more of just a genre that everyone feels comfortable with? Yeah, I don't know that we've really come to terms with it. It happened. Have we mm. come to terms with YouTube? I mean, it kind of, it happened. It's there. I don't think we really understand it yet. It may not last long enough for us to really understand it. For one thing, it's probably 200 million videos um, that aren't being saved. Nobody knows under what conditions they're being maintained. It's the big archives of our time, and yet it isn't in archives. They don't do preservation. It's a collection. Um, I think we're going to come to this kind of more slowly. Um, and, and also, what's it, what's it going to mean to have access to so much? I think um, it takes a long time for these to shake out. Go. Cool. Yep. Um, that's where I can go. I have found so many things that I would have never seen in my life, like episode, parts of uh, Streets of San Francisco. For sure. It's, it's a video access service. It's not an archive in the sense that it doesn't preserve its material, you know, and it doesn't really organize it in an archival way, so it doesn't... But, but it's an amazing phenomenon. You can be part of it, too. Uh, it, we don't know that YouTube is, is permanent. Brewster, is YouTube permanent? <laughs> and things disappear. Lots of things disappear from YouTube all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we don't need YouTube to, to save video. There's lots of other ways that, that we can collect video and film and other material and make it available. We can use the Internet Archive. There's many, many other services. And there's many archives that can collect physical material. But this is still very much in churn. Your point is well taken, though, because now most everybody in the world thinks that YouTube is what moving image archives are all about. And regular <laughs> moving image archives are never going to be able to catch up because their thunder has been stolen. What's interesting is YouTube looks like your old movies, really low res. You don't think you're stealing anything. <laughs> this is the great, you know, un, un, this I'm sure wasn't planned, but the low res in YouTube, you know, it, it cleanses you of any guilt. <laughs> right? I mean, I think it's... A, I didn't hear this. I keep it on a couple hard disks, and I usually don't look at it very much. It's just there. Right. Do you share it? I've shared a little bit of it uh, at the Internet Archive. A lot of it isn't very interesting. I should take the time and share more. Um, I'm not that good a, a shooter. Have you done a home movie night? Should you, we do one? Yeah. Uh, it'd be great to do a home movie night. Yeah. What's going to be, okay, we've got a century now of looking at moving images, basically. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the stuff that goes back a century, you're really going, you know, I, I just have contained a period longer than most people's lives. 100 years from now, if there's continuity, we'll have 200 years of that kind of continuity. I mean, pretty soon it gets to be like, well, let's just go back and, and look at some of the video of Vesuvius uh, erupting when it came down over Pompeii and Herculaneum. Uh, boy, look at the people run. I mean, <laughs> This stuff changes the relationship through time. It's got to. And so we already have 100 years of it. Just, so what's the future of this kind of access to, to the human past? I don't think we know. And I don't think we can put a value on it at this point. You know, we could argue that uh, universal access to everything will turn us into a more enlightened and historically conscious people. But I'm not willing to argue that. Um, <laughs> Well, look at this crowd. This is pretty conscious and enlightened. Yeah, well, this is a great crowd. I mean, uh, but the reason, you know, you, don't, you can't do this every day. How many of you would be here if you could do this 52 times a year? Like you do. I <laughs> <laughs> see. Um, so I think it's too early to tell. I don't think we've been able to uh, address this issue of having, you know, incredible simultaneous access to a lot of... And, and the fact is, actually, we don't. You can't see most TV news 
you know, it's enclosed. It's, unless somebody's grabbed it and put it on YouTube, it's usually not available to the public. You can't see, uh, most of the newsreels are held very closely by the newsreel companies. Um, for good reasons or bad reasons? To create artificial scarcity. Ah. They'll sell you a minute for $3,000 <sighs> and you can get in if you're a commercial film researcher and pay 50 an hour, but most archives are not really accessible. This is tip of the iceberg, you know. Well, it's at least Stuff. better than BBC did, which erased their archives because... Well, everybody is erased. Space. Yeah, everybody. Really? Everybody's erased. Thanks. But most of what's being shot by the people here is going to be, you know, erased or lost or whatever. Do you care? Um, I think about this. You know, you go to the Salvation Army, you're going to start... Are you going to start seeing flash drives and, you know, uh, <laughs> SD cards instead of uh, yeah. VHS tapes? So I have this contrarian attitude, you know, although I would never condone, like, intentional destruction of records, which is, like, um, which is, you know, essentially cultural warfare. It can be genocidal. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not super mm -hmm. concerned that everything won't survive because of this, this idea that history is driven by desire, and that desire is often for what we don't know, what we can't see, what we think is lacking. And a lot of the emergent histories of the past 30 and 40 years have been built on a sense that we don't know. We don't know very much about African-American history. We don't know very much about labor history. History of immigration has been swept under the rug. And that has caused people to dig deeper and try to find those documents. And so in a way, scarcity and desire drives the hunt, drives investigation, and, and brings histories to life. So I, you know, I'm not a, I, I don't want to destroy things, but I think sometimes when there's a lack of evidence, it has, a, it's formative. It's, hmm. I, you mentioned labor, and, and the strikes were mostly over by the time I was paying attention, and we were doing civil rights and other stuff. And so to just revisit in that footage, first the kind of cheerful guys walking in the streets with their hats, mugging for the camera, and then the not-so-cheerful, uh, and what's weird is the so-called riot. It hasn't changed. It's, you know, the tear gas launching, the, the running back and forth, the ducking behind cars, the basically street action. That, you know, that could have been shot any time in you know, Berkeley or various times. It, there is some emerging technology that's a little scarier. Oh, know? the stuff that paralyzes yeah, you? Yeah, the or paralyzing you things or and, the, you, uh, and the, the audio, the sound-based weapons so, help. Yeah, but there's people a, here will be shooting that, and we'll have that. You know. and except that some of it will also then zap all of the cameras. So that uh, <laughs> can that be? Is there a camera zapper out there? You can zap cell phone signals. Can you zap? I don't think you Michael can. Neymark's written about zapping cameras with laser pointers. You can. You have to do them one by one, right? Yeah. I guess you do. Yeah. I think both archivists and users uh, need to contribute to the context surrounding, you know, any kind of archival record by adding metadata, by commenting on it, by identifying things. This happens at the Internet Archive. We know we have 2,000 odd films online and mm -hmm. a lot of people do shot listing and do interpretation. The railroad buffs explain, you know, mm -hmm. what engine this is. It's pretty cool. Yeah, train spotting in time is clearly a big event here. But it, also there's this whole grassroots phenomenon of, of the meta phenomenon of tagging. Uh, Clay Shirky gave a talk in the series a while back and who said, uh, who knew that cats and sinks was a category? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, you know, I'm very hesitant about eternalizing the present mm -hmm. because the practice of three to five years you know, on a, a, a rapid changing medium, the web, it's, it doesn't tell us a lot. It doesn't give us a lot to chew on about how we're going to be relating to information down the road. But we are in a position to set some powerful examples now. And, you know, any of you can download San Francisco footage off the Internet Archive and queue your own 
uh, curate your own show. Quite a lot of this material is online. There's all sorts of possibilities. This isn't, as I say, the barrier to entry is not high, and I hope you will. Should we do this next year, Rick? Will you have enough new stuff? Will you know, people send you enough things? It's up to you. you know, this is a Tinkerbell moment. It's up to moment. you, yeah. <laughs> it's up to you. Um, I, I, I'm beginning to feel that I have no choice. But, uh, <laughs> but it is fun, and I'm, I'm delighted that so many of you turned out. I loved hearing what you had to say, too. It was uh, this kind of uh, this notion of um, the audience making the soundtrack. We should see a lot more of that. We should hear a lot more of that. Um, yeah. Thank you. We'll do it again. Thank you. Happy New Year.